so welcome back once again for another midweek with Double Creek here. Uh, we're glad to have you with us here for this midweek time. I hope you're enjoying these times that we're having together. Uh, looking forward to be able to do this in person some with some of you all soon uh, and then still share it online as well for people who are not able to come and do it in person with us. Uh, let's open up with a word of prayer here uh, for our time together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your many blessings, God. We just thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, God. We are thankful for uh, the love that you have for us, enough to send your Son, Father, to be willing to die on this cross for our sins, Father, as imperfect as we are. Uh, and so, God, we are, uh, thank you just uh, doesn't seem like enough, and, and it really isn't. Uh, so, God, we are so thankful for that. We're thankful for your word that we have to be able to dig into, uh, to look at, to see how we should be living, how we should treat others. Uh, and Father, we just uh, ask that you watch over us, and as we go through this time, Father, we continue to get a better understanding of what the Bible is saying to us as a whole, Father, throughout from beginning to end. Uh, God, I pray that you watch over those who are hurting and struggling within our church, within our communities, Father, those that are close to us. You know our wants, you know our, our, our needs and desires, Father, that if it's your will, you would place your healing hand upon them. Uh, Father, I pray that you'd be at this time that it honors and glorifies you. Pray this in your son's name. Amen. All right, so welcome back, as I said, for another midweek with Double Creek time. Right now we're in week 23 out of uh, 52 weeks. Uh, we're getting close to the halfway point in this core 52. Uh, for the last few weeks, we've been looking at from set some sayings from Jesus uh, that he talked about, that he mentioned within the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and once again, we're going to be looking at uh, some famous words of Jesus, but this time they are not coming from the Sermon on the Mount. I mentioned that last week, and I made a mistake. Uh, last week's did, but this week is not coming from the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, today, what we're going to be focusing on is um, some of the words that Jesus had to say about the cross. Uh, we're not going to be focusing on the time and the event, really, where Jesus was nailed to the cross. Uh, for the sins of the world. I mean, that's always the focus of the church, but that's not going to be our, our discussion here, our talk tonight. Uh, instead, we're going to be focusing on where Jesus tells us all, tells us that we need to take up our cross. So our core verses today come from Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 25, where, Jesus, where it says this. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You know, these are some very famous words out of the mouth uh, of Jesus. Some of the most famous words that we really have when you think about it when it comes to the Gospels. Um, and there's some great moments that take place just before Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 16. And so we're going to be focusing for quite a bit of our time today on the moments that take place in that, in that uh, chapter leading up to these words right here. And then we're going to finish off by looking at the end uh, uh, just a little bit at these verses. Our focus question for today is simply this. Who do you say Jesus is? Now, for most of you all who are listening to this right now, um, I think you already know who Jesus is. But still, I want us to not just know who Jesus is, but if we believe in who he really is, then we'll do what he says. Now, past the, about past the halfway point of, uh, of Jesus' three-year ministry, Jesus took his disciples to a particular place. Uh, they went to uh, the northernmost border of Israel to the area of Caesarea Philippi where Jesus asked them a question that you're probably familiar with. In Matthew 16, 13, it says this. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, if you remember one of our midweeks from uh, probably been a couple months ago, I guess now, it was about the Son of Man, and about how Son of Man could refer, obviously, to uh, a person who was born of a human, uh, but Son of Man, when Daniel referred to it from his vision, he was talking about deity, 
He was talking about a God. He was talking about Jesus Christ, who was in the form of man. And now Jesus is asking his disciples, who do people say I, the Son of Man, is? Now, clearly Jesus knew what people were saying about him. Clearly Jesus understood what people were thinking about him. And so their response to him was this. Well, some people think you're John the Baptist. There are other people who think you're Elijah. There are other people who think you're the prophet Jeremiah or some other prophet. And then Jesus kind of gets a little personal, gets it more personal with his disciples. And he says this, but who do you say that I am? No longer what do they say I am, who do you say I am? And so I want you to think about that question because we know the answer to it, don't we? Uh, we studied the scriptures. We know the scriptures to be true. Uh, we know the scriptures tell us that Jesus is who Jesus is. But these disciples at that time, it had not been revealed to them that Jesus was the Christ. That he was the Messiah. It had not been revealed to him who Jesus really was. But what you see next in this chapter of Matthew, just after this question, is the confession. It's what we sometimes call the good confession in our church. It's part of our, uh, what we do when people commit their lives to Jesus Christ. We ask them to, to repeat that good confession with us. Uh, and this is what we're going to see. Now imagine the disciples. Uh, imagine, I like to imagine what the disciples were doing when this question was asked to them. I imagine maybe there was a brief moment of silence where they maybe looked at each other uh, afraid to even attempt to answer that question. When Jesus says, who do you say that I am? But you know how it is when you got a group of people together and there's a question that is asked. There's usually that one person who likes to answer questions. Well, Peter was that one person among the disciples. And on more than one occasion, he was the one who would, was bold enough to step out. Maybe that's exactly why he was chosen as the one to preach that first gospel sermon in Acts chapter 2. But in verse 16, this is what we read. Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so that's the good confession that we have people repeat and say before people whenever uh, they commit their lives to Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that Jesus said, he who confesses me before men, him will I confess before my father in heaven. And so we use this confession right here that Simon Peter said. So I wonder if there was a brief pause right after he answered this. Because remember, this had not been revealed to the disciples who Jesus was. And so I wonder if the disciples kind of looked at themselves or looked at each other and thought, did Peter just really go there? But Peter gives his response that we know now is the good confession. And at least in our eyes, he improved our opinion of him immediately. We know what Peter went on to do with the rest of his life, or at least we, we don't know what he did every day, but we know how faithful he was and how important he was to the church and to Christianity in that very first century. But for someone who doesn't know, for someone who was maybe hearing this story or read it for the very first time, their good thoughts at this time about Peter would have increased immediately. Peter was spot on. We would say he hit the nail on the head. And in the 17th verse, Jesus lets Peter know it. In verse 17, it says this, And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And so for us today, you could say that we are taught that, who Jesus is, by our parents you say we are taught it by our Sunday school teachers, our vacation Bible school teachers, our preacher, or someone else in the church. You could say that somebody like that taught us who Jesus is. But even then, those people are still going to point to the Bible as where they got it from their source of truth. Peter didn't have that option. He gave his confession as to who he believed Jesus was, and Jesus lets him know that you're right. And he lets him know that this information was not revealed to you. It wasn't given to you by some person. It was revealed to you by God in heaven. Now, this was a question that had gone unanswered for a while now, really. The nation of Israel, they had been waiting for a Messiah. They'd been looking for a Messiah. 
Actually, in John chapter 1, there were people who thought that maybe John the Baptist was the Messiah. And throughout the ministry of Jesus, people kept asking the question, what kind of man is this? Because he was doing things people had never seen before. He was teaching in ways that people had never heard before. And they just couldn't understand what kind of man is this? Who is he? Well, finally, Peter answered Jesus. That Jesus was the Christ. That he is the son of the living God. And Jesus confirmed that Peter was right. Now, they still didn't understand it fully, I'm sure. They still thought at some time that the nation of Israel and probably even the disciples, they still thought at some time that they were getting a king who would destroy their enemies. That's what they were waiting for. What they got was a savior who would die for their sins. Jesus didn't kill their enemies. He died for them. And that was surprising for everyone. So what we see there is the confession by Peter. But soon after that, in Matthew chapter 16, right after that, we begin to see the objection. I'm not talking about the objection of who Jesus is uh, in this section. Uh, clearly there are people, uh, were people then, there are many people today who do not believe that Jesus is who he truly is. What I'm talking about by the objection is what happens next in this chapter. Remember, we're going over a couple of important moments leading up to those core verses today. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21, we read this. It says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Think about that real quick. Jesus finally reveals. He lived 30 years. Then he starts this ministry about halfway through it, a little more than halfway through it. He finally reveals who he is because Peter made that confession. And it gave Jesus a chance to confirm it. They're probably all full of excitement. And then Matthew goes straight into this. That we read that from that time on, Jesus began to talk to them about how I'm going to have to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be killed. And I think that must have been as much of a shock, maybe, as when they first realized who Jesus truly was. I mean, we finally got the Christ here, and now he's telling us that he's going to suffer and be killed. But what do we see happen next? Well, you see that one guy speak up again. Peter comes right back on the scene to respond to Jesus. In verse 22, it says this, Peter took him aside, and he began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. I'm telling you, it took some courage and some guts for Peter to do something like this. I mean, he takes the one who's admitted to them that he is the Christ, and he tells the Christ, you're wrong here tells the Christ that there's no way that what you just said is going to happen. It even says there in this verse that he rebuked Jesus. You know, wouldn't you like to have been a fly on a wall for that conversation right there? I mean, I said it took some courage and guts for Peter to do this. I didn't say it was smart for Peter to do this. And so here is what happens. Peter goes straight from being that bold person who made that confession in our eyes to being someone who can't keep his mouth shut. Now we're looking at him as a person who just doesn't know when to stop talking. Stop answering the questions you feel like. Peter goes from being praised by Jesus to then being rebuked by Jesus. Peter rebukes Jesus, it says, and then we read this in the very next verse. But he turned, to, but he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man. Wow. Peter goes from being the one that Jesus says is blessed to Jesus calling him Satan. And why? Not because Peter committed some great sin in our eyes. You know, we like to place those sin in categories. This one's bigger than this one, this one, this one. Um... In most people's eyes, what Peter did, uh, they would say, well, he didn't deserve to be called Satan because of that. 
I mean, he was the right-hand man to Jesus. Pulled out a sword and cut off the man's ear when they came to arrest Jesus. And here Jesus has to put him in his place. And he had to do it because, as Jesus said, Peter was only concerned about his own interests, not the interests of God. Jesus knew what needed to take place for the scriptures, for the prophecies to be fulfilled. He knew what his purpose was for coming to earth. He often, uh, how often anyway, how often do we want to place our own interests ahead of God in, God's interests? You know, if I think if we really stop and think about it, uh, I mean, if we really stop and think about it, I think we do it more than we realize, or more than we would like to admit. And the thing about what Peter did was this. His objection here, it could have derailed Jesus' mission in the plan of God. Jesus was harsh, but maybe it really wasn't unfair here. Satan tried to derail Jesus from completing his mission when he tempted Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. He wanted Jesus to use his power to show who he was and how great he was. That type of temptation was nothing new. It really goes all the way back to the division of the kingdom of Israel in 930 B.C., after Solomon's death, his son Rehoboam took over as king. And when he faced a difficult situation, the people came to him. Uh, they wanted relief. So Rehoboam sought counsel. And he had some different counsel, some young and old. And the young staff there told him, listen, you got to show strength. you got to be hard on these people. So Rehoboam takes their advice. And this is what we read in 1 Kings 12, 14. And he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, my father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. Rehoboam chose not to listen to the people. And because of that, the people of the ten northern tribes, they crowned another man as their king, Jeroboam. And so Jeroboam was a man who ended up setting up uh, golden calves uh, and idols there in both Bethel and Dan. Now, fast forward to Jesus here. He and his disciples, they're in that same area, basically, where these idols were, had been set up. Uh, most likely, Jesus' disciples probably understood what had happened there some 900 years before, in that place where the nation was derailed. And so Jesus is there, uh, the king there, in that place where the king had taken wrong advice. Rehoboam didn't have to take wrong advice, though. Because, you see, he had some older men who were wiser who gave him some advice as well. Their advice to Rehoboam was this. You need to be, be respectful of these people. You need to uh, speak good words to them. You need to serve these people. And in return, they will serve you forever. But Rehoboam refused that advice. Jesus, on the other hand, continued to do what he was supposed to do, even though Peter almost derailed the plan with his objection. And then Matthew takes us from the confession and the objection to the call. Jesus followed Peter's rebuke and in his own response with some of the most famous words from Jesus in the Gospels. Uh, there are those words from the core verses earlier where, Matt, where Jesus said this. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross. And follow me, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my life, for my sake, will find it. Now that's curious for them. It had to be for these disciples. Jesus has been talking to them, because remember it said from that time on, Jesus talked to them about how he would suffer and be killed. Jesus had been talking to them about how he must suffer, about how he must be killed, but now he's telling these disciples. Take up your own cross. You know, all Christians are required to crucify ourselves, not physically upon a cross. Uh, and we don't even like to think about it that way. We just don't want to. But it means we have to give up stuff. We have to give up our old self. We love to remember Jesus' death on the cross in communion. We'll wear his cross around our necks. Many people will get it tattooed on their arms. We'll wear the cross on shirts, all kinds of things. We think about his steps to the cross to be crucified. But we too are called to take up our own cross. 
before his crucifixion, Jesus called for his followers to take up their own cross and follow him. Paul himself said this in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. He said, I have been crucified with Christ, and it, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. The cross isn't just something that Jesus did for us. He modeled the cross for us. He modeled what it means to give yourself up. You know, the thought of the crucifixion on an actual cross is gruesome. People don't want to think about it. People don't like to talk about it. It's the worst way that you could possibly die. Psalm 22 talks about uh, the time when Jesus would face that. Psalm 22 contains graphic details about that moment, like the piercing of hands and feet, heart melting like wax, bones out of joint, enemies surrounding him, public mockery, naked exposure, uh, gambling for his garments, uh, extreme thirst. Now, Jesus had a good idea of what he was going to face one day. He knew it was going to be difficult. Just as it is difficult for each one of us to take up our cross, to crucify our old self. It becomes difficult for us to do away with our old self. To change from doing what we've done for so long in our lives to now living a new life for Christ Jesus. Because the old one has to be done away with. But that's what we're called to do when we take up our cross and follow Jesus. You know, Jesus' death saves our souls. And we love to sing about it. We love to pray about it. We love to hear sermons about that. But we're called to take up our own cross as well. To crucify our old selves. To do away with the old self. That's what Jesus has called us to do. So as we close here, it all circles back around to that question, who do you say Jesus is? People have seen him as a great teacher. People have seen him as a prophet. Uh, some people see him as just a hero or a good man. And some people still see him as only that. But he cannot be only a good man and those things I just mentioned because Jesus proclaimed to be something greater. He proclaimed that he was the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior of the world. So if he isn't the Messiah, that would make him a liar. But we as Christians know from the truth of God's word that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. We cannot celebrate a Lord we won't imitate. And that's what we're called to do. Just as Jesus had to give up himself, we have to give up ourselves, our old lifestyle, our old ways of living, our earthly lifestyle, uh, to still live on this earth, but to live for God. I hope you've enjoyed our time together for midweek here this week. Who do you say Jesus is? Thank you for joining us. I hope you're doing well and I hope you're staying safe. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your many blessings, God. We just thank you for Jesus, for making it clear to us through your word, Father, who he is. Uh, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Christ, that he is the Son of the living God, as Peter said. And so, Father, we thank you. we're so thankful when people make that confession, when people uh, repent, when people are willing to uh, put their faith in Jesus Christ and be immersed so that they can have their sins washed away, as the Bible teaches us, Father, so that they can answer the call, Father, to take up our own cross. God, I ask that you just watch over us and lead us and guide us. And as you lead us, I pray that we will follow. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.